Hi, Gaina Lynn Condi here with Come Follow Me Personal Study. We are going to jump right in. We're talking about Acts chapter 6 through 9. If you've seen this printable on any of my social media platforms, Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram, um, I hope they're helpful to put up in your kitchen, start discussions, breakfast, dinner time with your family during the week so that we kind of have it in our minds. I try to get these videos to you towards the end of the week before we have the Sunday discussions so that if you've studied, it will add to what you've already done. It helps you if you haven't studied and you're trying to catch up before Sunday discussion. So I wanna jump right into it because there's some amazing story characters in these chapters. Beginning of Acts chapter six, verses one through six-ish, it's the calling of these seven helpers. And the apostles needed help doing their ministering assignments, taking care of the poor and the widowed. And so they kind of created these camps similar to what Brigham Young did, where he um, had different camps divided up so that individuals and widows and the poor were cared for. And I think this is a pattern that you see. How's ministering going? I know that there are some that are really feeling great about it. There's others that are feeling like, um, everybody's MIA. So I think this is an important um, conversation to maybe have in your families as we talk about the ministering. Then we go into Stephen. The Stephen story is um, consisting of all of these conversions and miracles that are happening. And Stephen tries to um, stand before the Sanhedrin and they are not able to um, trick him and blame him. And he is despised for doing these mighty miracles in Jesus's name. He testifies of the Savior and he's transfigured. And he calls um, the Sanhedrin to repent. They see his face change. And I think it's so important to note that as Stephen t uh, testifies before the Sanhedrin, he is um, warning them and he is um, talking to them as we go into chapter 7 about um, the history of the Jews and he goes through everything and he really kind of speaks exactly to their history in their heart and he is um, he's kind of getting in their minds. They can't like remove themselves from the things that he's testifying of. He tells the story of Moses and his rise to power and killing the guards. He rehearses the miracles and the rescues. And um, he talks about um, how these new um, revelations, this, this um, Moses that they believe in is it's being fulfilled now. And he talks about the Red Sea and the manna and the holy ground. And then he goes on to um, really talk about God and the angel and the burning bush and, and the idols and, the, and worshiping the golden calves. And he references Solomon's temple. And I think it's so interesting that... Um, Moses really is pointing to Jesus Christ. Bruce Harder McConkie said, Indeed, Moses and Christ are companion prophets with the life and the ministry of Moses prefiguring that of the Messiah. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant and Christ of the new. And Moses gave Israel manna from heaven. Christ gave the bread of life. Don't you love that? And so Stephen is going right to the heart of what this the Sanhedrin believe already. And I think as a teacher, that's such a helpful tool, right? You teach and testify of what your student knows. And then Stephen sees the father and the son. And in that um, verses, uh, chapter 7, 55 through 56, as they're watching, um, Stephen in the midst of being killed. Saul is watching this happen and allowing it to happen. And we're going to talk more about Saul, but he witnesses the stoning of Stephen. But what I love about these verses is the peace that Stephen feels in the midst of this martyrdom. And it brought to mind of Shadrach, Meshach in the fire, uh, Nephi and Lehi in the Book of Mormon being surrounded by fire, and, and how often we 
can find peace in the midst of the scariest of circumstances as we keep eyes on Jesus, right? And focus on Christ in all that we do. And that's Stephen testified as a martyr with his life because he believed and, and stood for Christ. And even in the worst moment at the end of his life, he was of peace and he could see God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. Stephen is um, in the moment of I think this is important in the moment he's killed. He's asking for the forgiveness for those that are hurting him. Reminds me of Levi Savage, one of my favorite characters. And if you've seen 17 Miracles by T.C. Christensen, you'll know. I believe we're all called as disciples of Christ to have a Levi Savage moment where in humility we plead for the forgiveness and humility of others that have done us wrong. And if you know the story of Levi Savage, he, he was concerned about the late hour of the pioneers leaving and was reprimanded publicly. And then in private, they came to him and said, you were right. And so we may all be called to have those humble experiences in our lives. And, and as we go into Saul, we hear more about how he wreaks havoc. Acts 8 wreaks havoc. Saul was a faithful Jew and had become a great um, leader, had a permission and authority to um, wreak havoc. And... He has full permission to go to Damascus later on and do arrests and bring Jews that are converting to Christianity to trial. And Saul, though, we know as a faithful Jew, becomes a great apostle, and that story is coming. Philip ministers in Samaria, and, and um, this is the story of um, the, the um, desire Philip has for the buying of priesthood power. And I think for me, one of my big whys in the gospel is the priesthood power, the ordinances and covenants and the power of the priesthood through authority that is found only here. And that is the truth of what I know. Um, Simon tries to buy the gift of the Holy Ghost and um, Peter obviously is not going to sell it. And I, I love that... Um, the ideas of revelation are discussed here. Philip is prompted to leave and go to Gaza where he doesn't want to. But while he is prompted to leave, personal revelation sometimes is a prompting to do what we don't want to do. That's when I know it's it's God talking to me. Because when I don't want to do it, it's not me being confused that it's my thoughts. But as he goes, he meets this Ethiopian who's reading Isaiah. Doesn't this feel so validating? And he doesn't understand it. And so Philip talks to him. Or sorry. Simon, no, Philip talks to him. Sorry, so many names. Philip talks to him and um, he's converted. He wants to get baptized. I love this story because what a missionary miracle. And he is going to the place that he doesn't want to go. And he doesn't want to do this. And he and he follows the prompting and he goes. Um, revelation comes to those that are willing to move. Elder Oaks has said, we will get promptings of the spirit when we have done everything we can. When we are out in the sun working rather than sitting back in the shade praying. And I love that. So get up and move. And then when you have a thought, act on it. That's an important pattern of, of God. Okay, here we go to Saul. He continues to persecute the Christians. He is um, trying to stop the church from growing in Damascus because Damascus is this big hub. If it grows there, then it's going to be this cross um, place where others will find the, the gospel. And he goes, he has letters of authority. And, and I love that right away, we see this miracle where Saul is visited by Jesus and he is told, Jesus asks him, why are you, um, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against the pricks? Pricks are a stick that has points on it and, and it's used to, to corral animals. And so if you kick against that, you're just making the pain worse. And so he's asking why why are you pushing against this? Why are you making it harder? And it makes me think, what are we doing to push against God and making things harder? Then there's this beautiful conversion. He goes blind. He doesn't eat. And and he fasts for three days. And he he is converted. Um, I'm not going to say it correctly, but Ananias comes and is called to go uh, bless him and and then baptize him. And he knows he's the enemy that has persecuted all of these apostles 
And I love the story of Saul and what happens to him as he becomes Paul. And then Dorcas, this great seamstress that has served everyone is one of the mighty miracles of Peter. He raises her from the dead. He heals the man that's bedridden, just like the Savior. I love these chapters. I hope you find joy in them as well.